Hi guys, Mr. Vandergriff here with lesson 1.6, Ramona Chaparral Energy Pyramids and Trophic Levels. The learning intentions for this lesson are, all students will have a better understanding that energy isn't transferred efficiently through an ecosystem and that only 10% of the energy at each trophic level is passed on to the next trophic level. Second, all students will have a better understanding that if you eliminate a trophic level in a food chain, you will be able to support more organisms and there are less organisms at the top of the food pyramid because there's less energy to support them. The success criteria, I can create three food chains from the Wildlife of Chaparral handout and incorporate all three food chains into one extensive web model, food web model. Second, I can explain to my fabulous audience why energy isn't transferred efficiently through an ecosystem and that only 10% of the energy at each trophic level is passed on to the next trophic level. So you can see here, we have 100% energy with these plants and 10% of that 100% is obviously 10%. 10% of 10% is going to be 1%. 10% of 1% is going to be 0.1%. And this last level here, 10% uh, of 0.1% is 0.01%. Again, this will make much more sense at the end of the lesson. So please pull out your Wildlife of Chaparral handout, and you should have access to this in your packet or online. And we've got all these different cool things, red-tailed hawk, and we've got the red diamond rattlesnake, and the desert shrew, and the bush rabbit, and the mountain lion, the California grizzly, which is extinct, we, of course, now. The mule deer, coyote, gray fox, uh, tarantula, we've got all sorts of cool stuff here. Please study this, read over it, annotate it. Let me give you an example. So here, western fence lizard, or other known as the blue belly. Whoops. Um, you can see its prey, what it eats, its diet, its crickets, spiders, ticks, scorpions, and other western fence lizards. Hmm, eating of its own kind. A little cannibalism there. And then uh, here, what preys upon it would be hawks, other birds, foxes, raccoons, and snakes. So please make sure you study those two pages and this last one here. And then the assignment tells you that what you want to do is you want to add one more um, organism or animal. So you're going to look that up on the California Chaparral Institute website. You're going to sketch a picture. You're going to draw what it eats or list what it eats and then what feeds upon it. Okay. So that website looks like this here. And actually, let's just take them over to the website. Here we go. And once you get there, why don't you just go to like the species, different species. And from there... Um, it says common chaparral species. So again, we can see the five, five most common uh, birds in the chaparral. Um, and then there's some after, uh, what is this, birds after a fire that show up. Other chaparral birds, there's a burrowing owl. And then there's these six essential shrubs, the ceanophis, the manzanita, the chemise, scrub oak. You should know about all this stuff. So there's some great information here. Uh, let's just go to these birds and check this out. So let's go to uh, Scrub J. So we click on the Scrub J, and it takes us to this great website here. It gives us a lot more information. And what I really like here is you can actually hear what the bird actually sounds like. Right. Um, let's go with the toey right here. Let's see what the toey sounds like. Yeah, I've definitely heard that. What about the rent it? Rent it. Let's take a look at its listen to its call. Hmm. I definitely hear that sound a lot on my property, but also wherever I'm hiking. Iron Mountain, Mount Woodson. That's cool. So again, uh, this is where you're gonna go to get your information about your species. All right, let's jump back into our presentation here. And just a quick review, remember, it's coming from the sun, the energy going to the producers and then to the primary consumers, this earthworm, and then this toad eating the worm and then the gopher snake here. 
Remember, a food chain shows how organisms in an ecosystem get their energy. And the food chain definition would be, it's a model representing the sequential eating relationship among a group of organisms in an ecosystem, in this case, the chaparral. Food chains, um, they're also called autotrophs. And so this right here would be through photosynthesis. This is a hydrothermal vent. And then that would be chemosynthesis. Uh, producers, they do not have to eat other living things because they can make their own food, their own energy, their own energy storage molecules. How cool would that be? I would love to be able to just put my arms out and photosynthesize and grow a piece of fruit, grab it off, and then eat the food that I make. But we can't do that because we're heterotrophs, we're not autotrophs. But I want to show you this great video about this chemosynthesis. So take a look at this. It was a pretty cool discovery not that long ago. Bauer and his team were the first to see it, face to face. Hydrothermal vents. Immense chimney-like structures, several stories high, spewing hot water geysers, black with minerals and nutrients. The temperature around these deep sea vents was a scorching 760 degrees Fahrenheit. And then an astonishing sight. Life, thriving without sunlight, a biological community never seen before. An exotic garden of marine life, species without eyes, others resembling Triassic era fossils over 200 million years old. What we totally were blown away by were these giant tube worms. Come on, eight nine, ten feet tall, and when you cut them, they bled human-like blood. I mean, when the submarine landed, there was a squish, and red blood came up around all the portholes. And that's how, how eerie it was. And then to find these extremely unusual creatures living in this oasis, it had no relationship to the normal life of the deep sea. And yet here they were living in this toxic water, but yet these creatures were thriving on it. And then when we dissected, I remember we took one of these clams, and we opened it up in the first place, whew, as soon as we opened it up, it stunk. It, it was full of hydrogen sulfur. A horrible smell. Rotten eggs. Yeah. And we opened it up, and then we looked, and, and it, didn't look, it, it looked like beef. It was red, bright red. And it didn't have an anatomy of a clam. It was like, what happened to the clam? Someone had taken over its body, <laughs> and that something was a bacterium, a tiny bacterium that had figured out over eons of time, how to duplicate photosynthesis in the dark chemically through a process we now call chemosynthesis. And that was the discovery, that there was another life system on Earth that did not go by the book that you and I read, that was not living off the energy of the sun, but was living off the energy of the Earth itself. So, pretty amazing. It's called chemosynthesis. And again, when scientists discovered this at these hydrothermal vents in the bottom of the ocean floor, it was unbelievable because they're not using sunlight uh, for their producers down there, their autotrophs. They're using this chemicals, hydrogen sulfide, and then they're using carbon dioxide, and they're making glucose, and then from there starts a whole other food chain in the bottom of the ocean without the sun. But for the most part, um, everything up here on Earth and that we know of the sun is the main source of energy. And remember that consumers, they have to eat other living things to get their energy. Consumers are also called heterotrophs because they meet their energy needs by feeding on other species other than themselves. Primary consumer, they only feed on producers, plants. And then you've got secondary, tertiary, and quaternary consumers, and they typically feed on primary consumers like the coyote or the snake or tertiary, or like I said, quaternary. So, we've got our producer, again, we've got our primary consumer, we've got our secondary consumer, and then our tertiary consumer. Remember a prey and predator relationship. Prey, an animal that is hunted and killed by another for food, and a predator is an animal that preys on or eats others for food. So again, who is the prey and who's the predator? Right? Grizzly bear, predator, the prey is the deer. Here, king snake is the predator and the prey is the rattlesnake. Bobcat predator, prey is the bush rabbit.
lizard predator, and that's a Jerusalem cricket, and that is the prey. No, trick question, right? So the deer is not going to chase down the leaves, so the leaves are not prey. They're just grazing on the leaves, right? So that was a trick question. Food chain components. Keystone predators typically feeds at the top of the food chain and has no competition for prey, like the mountain lion or usually a red-tailed hawk or a grizzly bear or humans, right? Uh, what do you think was the keystone predator 200 years ago here in San Diego in the chaparral? What was it? Yep, you guessed it. California grizzly bear. Food web, a system of connected and interdependent food chains. The food chains are connected and can't be separated. Most organisms are a part of many food chains, and food chains can't stand alone. All right. So we've got California buckwheat and the bush rabbits eating that. And we've got the rattlesnake eating the bush rabbit. And we've got the red-tailed hawk. So this is one food chain. And we've got another food chain with the producer, the insect, shrew, red-tailed hawk. And then a raccoon could sneak up on a red-tailed hawk and consume that or if it was injured. All right, so these are two food chains. But when we connect them together, we make a food what? A food web, right? So again, you've got these different food chains, and as they're linked together, we call it a food web. This is very simple. This is a little more complex. But again, remember, it shows the energy transfer between all organisms in an ecosystem. Again, this is the chaparral ecosystem. So if you take a look at our lesson plans here, we've come down here. Now it says here, now create three Ramona Chaparral food chains and incorporate them into a big food web using your handout. So that's on your handout. You should go ahead and do the, pause the video and do that now if you haven't done that already. All right, lastly is uh, right here, you wanna watch this video that you're currently watching. Whoops, let's go back, called Energy Transfer in an Ecosystem. And let's talk about energy pyramids. So again, if you take a look here, th at the bottom of the pyramid, there's a lot more energy and it takes a lot more biomass to support the apex predator, which is up at the top. Again, one of the key uh, components of today's lesson is as you go up from each trophic or feeding level, it's very inefficient at uh, transferring that energy. Only 10% gets transferred at each level. A lot of it is lost at heat and just metabolism and other things that living things do. And then any, any of that mass uh, and matter is broken down, whether it's scat or whether the animal end up dying. You've got funguses and decomposers and bacteria breaking it down into the soil. And as it breaks down into the soil, it turns back into nutrients. And now the producers can use that and sunlight and CO2 and water to uh, recycle those nutrients back into the food or energy uh, pyramid. So let's take a simple food chain. So we've got grass, we've got grasshoppers eating the grass, we've got frogs eating the grasshoppers, and we've got uh, the trout eating the frogs, and we have a human eating the fish. So in order to support one human at the top of this food or energy pyramid or food chain, one human, let's say that the human, all they eat is fish. And I know this individual I used to teach science with, he loves to fish. He loves eating fish, all right? So let's say that's all he ate was fish and he could survive, eh, let's say if he ate one fish a day or maybe close to one fish a day. So within a year, let's say he eats 300 trout. That would be enough food, energy, calories to support one human. But those 300 trout are gonna need to eat something to survive. And so let's say for those trout, they're gonna need 90,000 frogs to support 300 trout for one year. Okay, so 90,000 frogs. Well, those 90,000 frogs need to eat grasshoppers. And so they're gonna have to eat, at least eat 27 million grasshoppers within one year to support 90,000 frogs. And a herd of 27 million grasshoppers are gonna need at least one ton of grass to survive for a year. So very simple food chain. But now we're gonna turn it into a food pyramid. So we just took that to into this food pyramid. 
So right here, if you take a look, the sun's energy is striking down here, this grass. And 99% of the energy, the solar energy, the photons coming from the sun, 93 million miles away, it gets lost, it gets filtered out, it bounces off the leaves, it gets wasted. 99% of the energy goes to waste and the plant is only able to absorb or to use or photosynthesize 1% of that sun's energy, okay? But the good thing is there's so much solar energy, 1% is a lot, all right? So, but now the grasshoppers need to eat this grass and they're only going to get 10% of that total energy. As they go up to the next level and the frogs eat the grasshoppers, they're only going to get 10% of that energy or that biomass or those calories. And then as the trout eats the frogs, you guessed it, it's only going to be able to get 10%. And then as the human eats trout, they're only going to be able to get 10% of that energy. Okay. So let's take a look at what this looks like. We need a lot of organisms down at the bottom of the energy pyramid to support very few living organisms at the top because of this loss of energy, mainly through um, heat and metabolism. All right, so let's take a look here. It's apparent that the number of organisms that can be supported at the top of the pyramid is directly related to the number of layers the pyramid has. The more layers in the pyramid, the less that can be supported at the top. The less layers in the pyramid, more can be supported at the top. So if we shorten this food pyramid, we shorten, if we shorten this energy pyramid, we can support more at the top. For example, if you take a look up here, if we get rid of the trout, and let's say instead of the human eating trout, now he's going to eat frogs. Let's say he can get by by eating 10 frogs a day. So if we get rid of the one trophic level and he feeds on 10 frogs a day, remember people eat frog legs, right? Um, it's supposed to be a delicacy. It's one thing I haven't tried yet. Uh, so if you could survive by eating 10 frogs a day, that would support 30 people now instead of one. Why? Because we saved all that energy that the trout would be losing in that trophic level. But let's say eh, I'm not really into eating frogs. So now let's get rid of that trophic level. Let's remove the second trophic level. And let's say, you know what? I bet humans, we can eat insects, right? So let's say you could get by with eating 100 a day. You know, maybe the first day or two you wouldn't eat 100. Maybe you'd only eat 75, right? Because, But you'd work your way up to an appetite of eating 100 a day. So if you eat 100 a day to survive, a lot of protein, um, that you're going to be able to support not one human, not 30 humans, but you're going to be able to support 900 people now. Why? Because we've got rid of two trophic levels and we've saved all of that energy, right? Entomophagy is the actual word of the studying or the practice of eating insects. And so people eat insects all over the world. I've eaten some crickets before and other things. Um, again, in the United States, we usually eat them just for kind of a novelty or for a bet. Here's one of my former students in the desert. And his parents and friends said, we'll give you $100 if you eat a live stink bug. I would not do that. <laughs> Looks like he did get his money, and it sounds like his mom had a good laugh. So uh, anyway, I would make sure your insects are dead before you try to, uh, to eat them. So let's get back to our energy pyramid. So let's say, eh, we don't want to eat insects. Let's get rid of the fish, the trout. Let's get rid of the frogs. Let's get rid of the grasshoppers here. So there's 27 million grasshoppers. We're getting rid of them, and we're going to just straight eat grass. And you're like, we can't eat grass. Actually, remember, rice is a grass, right? 
So we eat plants so people can eat that. So about, you could support now, not one, not 30, not 900, but 2,000 humans by eating three pounds of grass a day that could support 2,000 humans for a whole year. Now remember at the very beginning, this exact piece of land or ecosystem could only support one fisherman, one person at the top eating fish. But if you take all those trophic levels out, you're gonna save all that wasted energy. And so in the article I was reading, it kind of finished up, summarized with this. It says, the simple rules of energy pyramids require people in India or China um, to eat more grass or rice. But in Europe and America and other Western parts of the world, there's a variety of diet that includes a large amount of chicken and beef and lamb and pork and fish. But the rising prices of meat in the supermarkets show us, among other things, that our expanding population and nudging us down the food chain toward a more vegetarian diet. Right, so just saying that if you take those trophic levels out, you're going to save a lot more energy. Now let's bring this back to the chaparral, and we, I came up with the chaparral um, energy pyramid. So you've got 600 tons of California buckwheat that would support 2,600 bush rabbits, and those amount of rabbits would support 24 coyotes, and that would support one mountain lion. So here's the question. Imagine that all the coyotes were taken out of the food chain. So we get rid of these coyotes. Would more or less mountain lions be able to survive if they ate bush rabbits instead of coyotes? Explain your reasoning using the 10% energy rule. So think of this. If the coyotes were removed, let's say they were hunted psh, over and they're gone, would there more or less mountain lions be able to be supported? Go ahead and pause the video, answer this question, think about it, and we'll get back to this. All right, you got your answer? So, first let's take a look here. Remember that out of the 600 tons, 100% of the total energy is available here. But as it's transferred, as the rabbits eat it, only 10% of that total energy that the, from the photosynthesis of these energy storage molecules, this glucose, this biomass, only 10% of it transfers to the rabbits. Now out of this, what's going to be transferred to the coyotes? Right, Only 1% of the total energy from down here. And then what's going to be uh, transferred to the top, the apex predator, the mountain lion? You guessed it, 0.1% of the total energy. Okay, at each trophic level, 90% is lost to cellular respiration, uh, when it comes to the rabbit hopping and chewing and running from prey and reproduction, right? 90% is lost at each trophic level. Only 10% is transferred to each trophic level. So by the time you get up here, there's very little energy, and that's why there's very few uh, apex predators. Again, if it's in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest, you're not going to have that many jaguars in a you know certain area. You're not going to have that many green or yellow anacondas. You're not going to have that many caiman at the top here. You're going to have very few because it takes so much energy to support those at the top. All right? So the mountain lions have more energy available when they eat the rabbits versus the coyotes. So they're going to save all this energy being lost here and here that's being put into the coyotes. So they're going to save that. That's going to be able to support more mountain lions. The more energy is conserved and less energy is wasted when the trophic level of the coyotes is removed. Or another way of putting it, the mountain lions have more energy available when they eat the rabbits versus the coyotes. Just like in the last example with the fishermen, when you got rid of the fish, instead of supporting one fisherman, one human, you could support 30 if we got rid of the fish and just started eating the frogs. Okay, same example here. Now, last question. Estimate a quantity or a number of mountain lions that could survive off of 2,600 rabbits. Describe how you came up with your response using math. Yes, use your math. Your math teachers are amazing. They taught you great skills. So again, pause the video, come up with a number, use some mathematical calculations, make sure you're using the 10% rule where it's only 10% of the energy is going up each time. 
or 90% is being lost at each trophic level. Pause the video and try to figure out this energy pyramid challenge. All right, let's see what you came up with. If you had 10, you are correct. 10 mountain lions could be supported if you got rid of the coyote trophic level. In this food chain, the coyotes contain the energy equivalent of 260 rabbits. So 2,600 rabbits can support 24 coyotes. But remember, only 10% of this biomass is going to be transferred up here. So what's 10% of 2,600? 10% would be what? 260 is 10% of 200, 2,600 rabbits. So that means the energy of 260 rabbits feeds one mountain lion. So for 260 rabbits, it will support one mountain lion. So if we get rid of this trophic level, how many times will 260 go into 2,600, All right? So it's gonna go in there 10 times. That means the energy of 260 rabbits feeds one mountain lion. So if the mountain lions directly feed, directly, skip the coyotes, directly feed on 2,600 rabbits, it would be enough energy storage molecules to feed 10 mountain lions. So again, the math would look like this, right? 2,600 divided by 260 equals 10 mountain lions that could be supported up here. So I really hope you enjoyed the lesson on the chaparral food chains, food webs, and energy pyramids. And I hope this lesson was helpful.